Welcome to the Psychedelic Suitcase. I'm Dave McNee. In this episode, we talk with Mark Hayden. Mark has worked in the field of addiction counseling for close to 30 years. He's also the executive director of MAPS Canada. MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And what do they do? Well, they are currently on their third phase of a clinical study where they are treating people with post-traumatic stress disorder with the drug MDMA and getting really good results. We talk about that, the history of psychedelics in Canada and the U.S., drug reform, and what he envisions coming down the road in terms of facilitated psychedelic drug therapy. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Here's Mark Hayden. Mark, thank you very much for coming on the show. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I've heard you talk a few times about sort of the history of uh, psychedelics in, in particularly Canada. Um, and I was wondering, before we get back to that, where do you think we went wrong, if that makes any sense? Um, compared to the indigenous cultures around the world, it seems that we sort of lost track a little bit of, uh, of what we really should be going after in life in some ways. And uh, it, it seems that we maybe had that at some point, but maybe through... Uh, bad laws or or uh, just the sort of demonization of things like psychedelics, we, we didn't actually incorporate them into our culture the way that other people have. Um, and I was just wondering what you thought, where, where was the point where it sort of went off the rails? Well, if you think about indigenous communities and how they have integrated psychedelics into their societies, they always control and contain the psychedelic experience through the practice of ritual and structure and leadership by elders. And it doesn't matter which community you go to, it's always that. It's, it's, it's never just a teenage thing. It's always woven into the fabric and it's about connection. It's about connection to the land. It's about connection to the spirit, it's about connection to the community. It's about connection to the medicine. There's, there's a, a process of, of connecting that is woven into how indigenous people have used psychedelics forever. And for the first time ever in the 1960s, Tim Leary linked psychedelics with a disconnection message. Tune in, turn on, and drop out. And it was a younger folks thing. I mean, the backdrop of the Vietnam War and the fear of the baby boomers just put psychedelics in a completely different place than all other indigenous communities have had them. And there was a backlash. There was a backlash not just against psychedelics, but again, back against the whole baby booming generation and cannabis and drugs and psychedelics and and so we um we're slowly digging ourselves out of that particular mess that we created a few years back well also to introduce uh, yourself as well um you're the chair of maps canada uh which is the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies and they're currently um, involved in a series of tests with the mdma to treat pdsd so if you could talk about the results that would be great the current treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder don't work very well. Um, there's somewhere the literature says about 10% and people are selling post-traumatic stress disorders to the military will claim up to 25% effective. So the range is somewhere between 10 and 25. The first study that was done with Michael Mithoffer um, demonstrated an 83% level of effectiveness. That was kind of the exploratory open label study. And, um, and it got everybody's attention. So the question, if you're a completely skeptical exterior person looking at that data, if you're proposing an 83% level of effectiveness versus the 10 to 25%, you would say that they're lying, they're falsifying their data. So the way you prove that you're not is you do it with more sites, with more therapists in multiple countries, and you have lots of oversight, like the FDA in the United States, like Health Canada in Canada. And so far, we are continuing to demonstrate a high level of effectiveness. It isn't quite 83%, but it's, it's really good. And it's way better than traditional treatments. Mm -hmm. So that with, with encouragement, um, we're plowing forward. In fact, the FDA in the United States looked at our data and said, we want to give you breakthrough status. That means it's so effective and it... They, they just want to speed, speed the access. They want to allow people to access it as quickly as possible. Right. So it's yeah. exciting. So is, is the plan to open up centers where, and how, is, how would this be administered to, to the patients? Well, in Canada, we'll finish our phase three and we will give that data to the federal government. And then fingers crossed, I'm optimistic that they will say, yes, this is now a legal prescription drug. 
and the sponsor of the drug gets to say what the rollout looks like. And the sponsor of the drug is Maps USA, and they will essentially license facilities, license um, or certify trained practitioners, and sell MDMA to them. And so we'll have a, a rush on our hands of people really wanting to provide this service. So how quickly can we roll it out in a way that still maintains the quality of the service is the things that we're thinking about now. Would it be something that would be an additional cost to people or would it be something that's sort of being considered under the coverage of somebody's normal health care? Right now, I don't think the federal government has even started to think about that question. Yeah, right. So, you know, I, I would anticipate initially it would be a private pay. Right. Maybe later, if we can prove that it's saving the government money, essentially the cost of having veterans on disability allowance um, is challenging. I mean, that's a huge issue in the States. It's not as much in Canada, but it's the, these are the kind of things, these are the cost-benefit analysis you have to do to show the government that it's actually a worthwhile investment. I think I heard uh, your counterpart in the States talking about how these centers that you're hoping to open up at some point, um, and maybe this is just in the States, I'm not quite sure, uh, they would be more than just for healing and more for, uh, but also he was talking, you know, everything from couples therapy to even just uh, spiritual experiences that someone could have. There's multiple initiatives that are shifting how people think about drugs and specifically psychedelics. There's the research initiatives. So there's the, once you have passed a phase one, two, and three clinical trial, you can legally prescribe that medicine in the context that's specified. Yeah. So um, that's, that's one track, but there's a whole other track. The track is the legalization of psilocybin mushrooms initiatives in the States, and there's multiple of them. And there's an initiative here as well to allow therapists to use it for end-of-life anxiety. So there's that sort of drug policy reform piece of psychedelics, and then there's the research piece. And they're both pushing public opinion, but uh, I don't know which will happen quicker. I mean, if right. they said we're going to decriminalize all psychedelics or even all drugs um, in the Portuguese kind of model, what would we do? I mean, that would hopefully the, the elders of the psychedelic community would, would start to do training um, and there would be um, the service would slowly unfold in a way that maximize benefits and minimize the harms. Right. And I guess, yeah, just regulation and how it would be regulated, I suppose, is my next question is, how do you, in, in a sort of perfect world, how do you see it being regulated and administered? Well, if you want to, if you look at psychedelic drugs, there are, there's essentially one potential harm. Um, if you, I Google, I have Google alerts on my computer for all the different psychedelics. And so every day I get the media news dump in my box and a lot of it about things that went wrong with psychedelics. And so you, but it all comes down to one thing, which is lack of supervision, right? Lack of skillful control of dosage of set, which is the expectation of setting, which is the environment of setting people up for the experience, debriefing appropriately, allowing for integration work. If that's done skillfully, the problems with psychedelics go down to incredibly low. It's not zero, but it's incredibly low. Right. So in a post-prohibition world, psychedelics would be, the psychedelic experience would be available to people, but it'd be available by trained practitioners who knew how to set people up for the experience. And hopefully were wise elders, which is essentially what the indigenous communities have been saying for years, is that this thing has to be structured in a way that isn't just about people running into the grocery store and grabbing some and running out going, gee, let's go driving. I mean, that would produce a real problem for us as a society. But if it's available through skilled practitioners and the context of the skilled practitioners could vary widely. I mean, it could be indigenous ayahuasca circles. It could be indigenous peyote circles, which are very different. Right. It could be psychedelic psychotherapy using LSD or psilocybin for anxiety or depression. It could be MDMA therapy for PTSD. It could be... It could be multi-day dance festivals. You know, it doesn't really matter what the context is. So long as somebody's in charge and they're trained and they screen appropriately and they debrief appropriately and they structure the situation to maximize the benefit. So at the end of the day, I don't think there's just one model, you know. So right. 
indigenous groups could continue to do what indigenous groups have always done. So the peyote people would still do it in the same way they've always done it. The ayahuasca mm -hmm. folks would still do it the same way they've done it. If somebody wants to go and get psychedelic psychotherapy with MDMA for PTSD, they'd probably experience a MAPS type protocol. Right. It doesn't really matter the circumstances. You just need somebody in charge managing set setting and safety and dosage issues. And there's a lot of room in that for a wide range of different experiences. Many people have experienced ayahuasca ceremonies. Yeah. It, it, in fact, it's really, if I think about the shift in how people work with these kind of medicines, as a result of doing a ton of ayahuasca ceremonies, it, it changes things because people are now bringing the ceremonial aspect to other substances because they see the beauty of a structure of a, of a structured ceremony. Right. So throughout Vancouver, there's green ceremonies and people are in yoga with cannabis ceremonies. And there's a whole variety of different people who are taking sort of in, I would describe them as indigenous-like structures and applying it to cannabis, which I actually think is a great idea. Mm -hmm. The more ritualistic control that we weave around a substance in a society, the less problematic our collective relationship with that substance is. Right. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and also just once again, provides a connection with a group of people. And it's, it's nice to, to know that there are efforts being made to sort of have that connection restored conference on November 2nd uh, in Vancouver. What are you planning on talking about there? Oh, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. Yes. I'm running a panel that asks an interesting question. Is underground therapy helpful or harmful to the process of legalization? Mm. And that's a really interesting question because it's, it's not clear. I think one way of thinking about it is what city, really tight city architecture rules do to buildings. Because it, when I have a brother who's an architect and, and he observes that when the city comes in and regulates a lot, what happens is you lose all the best and you lose all the worst. So the top wildly beautiful, extravagant, artistically decadent buildings aren't appropriate and yep. the horrible buildings aren't appropriate. So what you get is this sort of mediocre thing in the middle. Right. So it's interesting to look at psychedelics through that lens is I think the more we regulate, um, the more we'll lose both ends. I mean, there are some underground therapists that are absolutely fabulous. Yeah. And there are others that are uh, very unskilled. They don't have right. the knowledge, the skill or the training or the personality to do the work. Right. So there's a real mixture out there. And so the people who do it excellently help the messaging and the people who do it terribly are harmful to the messaging. I've heard you talk also about um, the language of psychedelics, and, and I think that's really important as well, even just the term psychedelics. When psychedelics first came into the Western culture, they, the belief after Albert Hoffman invented LSD, the, they were essentially made available to psychiatrists. And the belief at the time was that it would help psychiatrists to understand schizophrenia. So the language that they used was appropriate for that belief, which was psychomimetic, which means mimicking a mental illness. And then they continued using it for a while and then <laughs> decided that actually wasn't particularly helpful for helping them to understand schizophrenia. And they, but they noticed people had some pretty visual, dramatic, dramatic visuals around the whole experience. So they called them hallucinogens, which basically means seeing stuff. And as they continued to develop some maturity and understanding, it, they understood that there's a lot more going on. This really isn't about seeing stuff. This is really about manifesting the mind. It's about access to unconscious material. People become a lot more um, introspective and able to share levels of their personality that they can't normally. So the word psychedelic essentially means mind manifesting. And, and that's the word that essentially the researchers have decided to use because it's the most accurate. Now, the downside of the word psychedelic is it also has a lot of cultural baggage as in psychedelic art and psychedelic culture. So researchers aren't applauding that use of the word psychedelic. They're just applauding the, the, what the word actually means, which is mind manifesting. Now, subsequent to that, other people came along and said, well, there, these, these medicines have been used by indigenous cultures for years to explore spirituality. And that's the word entheogen, which is you know, a manifesting of the spirit. And then other people came along and said, well, you know, if you include MDMA and MDA and that, that whole empathogen group, that really needs a new 
and some new languaging around that. So empathogen, which means connecting to others. And somebody tossed out intactogen, which is connecting to self and your own larger sense of your personality and the depth of your personality. Right. So there's been a lot of words bounced around. Um, but for, for the, the most researchers believe the most neutral word is psychedelic. It, it, other ones are flavored more. And so the most, the most accurate word to use that is not biased is psychedelic. In Canada here, are we affected much by the American policies? That's not a simple question. There's some complexity to that because essentially Canadian popular opinion changed dramatically with cannabis as a result of the legalization initiatives in states. So we looked at what was happening in the states the majority of Canadians then said, we need to do this. And Justin Trudeau got in front of the podium or in front of the parade on the podium right. and, and said, okay, we're going to fully legalize cannabis. He did that because he read the polls. The polls supported it. And the reason why was because the Americans started the discussion. Now that we fully legalized it, and it seems to be just fine, uh, by fully legalized, you know, the American, it's a state by state, state initiative. In Canada, it's a federal initiative. Right. So what the United States sees is the whole country has done it and it seems to be just fine. And in fact, people are making money. And so it's, right. it's economically viable for lots of folks. So yes, we, we do push each other back and forth. Um, within the world of psychedelics, it's a little more different. It's a little different because the MDMA will be legalized in both Canada and the States at around the same time because it's a multi-country study. The psilocybin initiatives in the States are unique to the States. We don't have you know, the end of life anxiety with psilocybin and the depression for psilocybin isn't a Canadian initiative. It's an American initiative. Right. So um, that will push us hopefully, but we won't immediately roll it out in the same way we'll immediately roll out MDMA for PTSD because that is a Canadian study. It's a multi-country study and, and Canada is part of it. How do you see psychedelics benefiting um, just medicine in general? How do you, what do they offer that other things don't offer? Well, I, I think on the scale of evangelical, I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, there's some <laughs> people out there that really talk about, you know, healing the relationship with the universe. And I think that we need to start with more realistic, more realistic uh, expectations. I mean, yes, it will help specific treatment indications. Mm -hmm. You know, it will help people with depression, anxiety, end of life anxiety, PTSD, so sort of very, uh, cluster headaches, you know, so there will be specific indications. Um, we're, we're talking about doing an eating disorder study. We believe that we could really help eating disorders. So there'll be specific indications that come down the pipe that psychedelics won't fully cure, but they'll certainly probably be a more effective treatment than traditional treatments. And so that will shift public opinion. And hopefully then the public will push the federal government to legalize it and then hopefully it'll be available in a contained yeah. kind of way. In, for the MDMA trials, for example, what is MDMA doing that uh, other things can't do to the brain? We, we can guess at the answer to that question because we, we don't actually know the answer, right. but we can guess. So the, the model that most researchers discuss is essentially psychedelics give you access to your unconscious mind they reduce the permeability and if you think about what your unconscious mind is it's what drove the car today if you happen to drive a car you know you're you weren't thinking about your feet at all what you're thinking about is lunch and the meeting you want to have your conscious mind is doing you know random comments to yourself about how the world is working and what you're immediately planning what you think about what's going on, on the radio your unconscious mind is driving the car you don't go left foot, right foot, push now with your conscious mind. Right. But we have lots of stuff that happens in our unconscious mind all the time. It essentially runs our life. And you know, we have lots of feelings. And as we meet people and we respond emotionally, that's all coming from our unconscious mind. And so PTSD is a buried tape loop in the unconscious mind. And there's a reduced mm -hmm. permeability. So you can kind of get into it, into your unconscious mind and, and find the tape loop. And the second aspect is traditional therapies, when they become close to that tape loop, there's a huge fear response. And so with MDMA, it reduces the fear response. You can actually go into the tape loop and kind of rework it in a way that seems to release some of the emotional energy around it that's so destructive in people's lives. I ran into an individual, for example, who has schizophrenia. And mm -hmm. he's essentially, over a multi-decade process, he figured out 
that high dosages of anything, cannabis or, or psychedelics, are really horrible for him. They destabilize him and, and his life goes completely off the rails. But what he discovered is a very, very small dose of either LSD or mushrooms um, seems to change the voices. And the voices that he has in his head are normally negative, judgmental, um, destructive, um, nasty voices that are uh, very condemning of him. And when he takes a psychedelic microdose, tiny, tiny amount, the voices are still there, but they change and they become very loving and positive to him, hmm. which is quite something. And so um, I've just never heard that story. No. I, I dug around in the literature and I found one paper that observed that schizophrenics in groups when given a low dose of LSD function better. It was just one paper. And that was in 1956, I think it was published. So I've really dug and I really can't find any literature that, that explores the relationship of low dose of psychedelics with schizophrenia. All of the literature with high dose has its problem. It's very destabilizing. Right. I just think it's an interesting enough story that I decided to write up the story of his life. So I'm kind of writing his biography. It's an interesting story and, and treatments for schizophrenia right now really don't work very well. They're very sedating and have lots of side effects. And, and if there was something out there that would help treat schizophrenia, now, yeah. admittedly, in the research world, that's a high-hanging fruit. You know, no researchers are talking about that. So it's a, that's going to be a long, slow one. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. And it is interesting that there seems to be, for this gentleman anyway, uh, or a patient, it seems to be there is a threshold in which it turns from positive to negative. Um, yeah. yeah, which is fascinating. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And so maybe one day um, this will, you know, I have no idea, but it may want to help um, improving treatments for schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I'm, I'm writing the book of his life and his relationship with psychedelics, but I'm also planning a survey because I'd like to uh, ask, you know, with microdosing, does anybody have um, schizophrenia and what, what are the, why are they taking a microdose and what impact is it having? Right. Because some of the surveys have noticed uh, that there's a small number of people with major mental health disorders that microdose, but we don't know why. So I'd really like to uh, do a survey that finds out that. It seems microdosing is, in the last few years, just sort of been this, this buzzword, but it's, it seems to be attributed to you know, people in Silicon Valley trying to you know, get more out of their workday sort of a thing. Um, and I wonder at what level of dose um, it would change for that, that, that person. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And, and it'd be interesting to see the, the results of, of the survey as well. Because um, yeah. you, you, might, you might have hit on something that, uh, yeah, like you said, not many people are, are looking into. So that's great. In terms of other interesting projects, I yeah. just accepted a publication of a paper where I, I found three people who had taken massive accidental overdoses of LSD. Right. And we would never in any kind of research study be able to give people that, those kind of dosages. So we'll never know unless we find people who have taken a lot and then find out what their experience was. And what, uh, it was quite interesting because one of the individuals had had a long history of bipolar, like um, manic depression, right. and, um, and had essentially been healed by the experience. And, and it had been documented because she was under the care of a mental health team. So it was documented, she had a long, long history. So she was under, she had, she had had both psychiatric and case note and, and counselor case note notes. And then she had this um, unfortunate, it, at the time, event. And afterwards, she went back to her psychologist and, uh, and psychiatrist, and, and they were really puzzled. And they documented again and again that she seems to be just fine. Hmm. And uh, so it was an interesting case because I had so much medical documentation indicating that she was really quite unwell right. before the experience and essentially healed after the experience. Wow. Was, so the, was, was the experience uh, itself, obviously, it's, obviously, if she took that much, it, it was probably not a very pleasant experience, the actual LSD experience. Yeah, um, it was always, all of the overdoses that I talked to had a horrible experience. Right. Um, yeah, it was really unpleasant. Lots of vomiting, um, you know, just rolling around completely out of control. Right. They took a lot and it was extremely unpleasant for them and extremely unpleasant for the people around them. It is incredible that something positive could come out of that. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, there that's were amazing. three, there was, I, I studied three cases and one seemed to have cured her bipolar. The second um, was just a woman who was pregnant at the time and she gave birth to a very happy, healthy boy who's now grown up. The, the incident was like 18 years ago and so right. um, it's, he's fine. So that was interesting because she, she was two weeks pregnant. Right. And the third case was um, an individual who had done an absolutely massive dose. I mean, she thought she found a line of cocaine in her boyfriend's bedroom. Right. Yeah. And she snorted it. It wasn't cocaine. It was LSD. 
So she was really, really sick. She just vomited and vomited for hours. But what came out of it after she eventually came down was she had, she had had a morphine addiction going into it and she came off her morphine with no withdrawals, which is unheard of. And she, she was on a morphine because of a lot of physical pain and, mm -hmm. and the physical pain seemed to resolve itself for a while. And, and then she was playing afterwards, trying to see if she could manage physical pain. Mm -hmm. She subsequently played with morphine a little bit and she would use LSD to start to work with that and to try to improve her relationship with both pain and morphine. And to some extent it worked, you know, it, it wasn't an outrageous success, but it certainly was an interesting case study. I want to talk to you a little bit about, and this is kind of going back a little bit. Uh, I'm just sort of fascinated about the history of it, I guess, and more about that, I suppose. I mean, there were historical Aboriginal traditions um, that we don't know a whole lot about, but then um, the Albert Hoffman invented LSD and it went into the community of psychiatrists and Weyburn, Saskatchewan was the hospital where there was doing most of the research. There was a hospital in New Westminster called Hollywood Hospital that was also having giving psychedelic experiences to people and documenting what they did and doing a little bit of research. So the, between those two centers, there was about a 15 year period um, where it was promising. And if I was going to say there was one piece of research that they're most excited by, it was LSD for the treatment of alcoholism. Right. And then, this, and they were continuing to publish and they were completely optimistic that this would transform a lot of different um, psychiatric treatments. And then the whole 60s thing, the, the rebellion against um, the parents, the rebellion against the Vietnam War, and the huge number of young people who were loudly yelling and, um, and then the young people smoking cannabis and then taking psychedelics and, and advocating disconnection and, and, and complaining loudly about their parents' you know, industrial jobs and, and they were a part of the system that was corrupt. And so there was a, a kind of a battle. And in that case, the government did what they often do is they take the people they're targeting and they criminalize their drugs. Mm -hmm. They criminalized cannabis and they criminalized psychedelics. And it could have been very different, you know, if there weren't that number of young people all at one time and it was introduced slowly through indigenous communities and it was um, people would join the churches and then talk about how it helped them to function well in their lives. And it, it could have been different, but um, right. just the cultural context of the time resulted in the huge backlash against psychedelics and, and cannabis and, and drugs were criminalized. Yeah. So it's just only. It seems only recently in the last few years that uh, it's opened up again. And what, so what made it open up again? What, what was the cause of, how has the research now started up? Well, I, I think there's not a simple answer to that question. I think there's multiple. I think the baby boomers grew up, so there's no threat of them anymore. And the baby boomers are now in positions of power and they're going, you know, that actually wasn't such a bad experience back in my teenage days. And, um, and there's a desperate need for new mental health diagnoses, you know, or, or new mental health treatments. So, and, and the, the, the brilliance of Rick Doblin saying we want to treat soldiers and police really shifts the messaging, you know, completely. Because it's, you know, when you're, you're treating soldiers and police with PTSD, yeah. the messaging is that we're treating people who are revered by our society and we're giving them psychedelics. So, so the messaging is, is completely different now. Right. And that's really what's bringing it back slowly. But there was somebody, and I don't know who it was, but somebody made a decision to allow psychedelic medicine to be to, to go through the stage one, two, and three clinical process, right. which all other molecules go through. You know, if you want to scrape the guts of a sea cucumber and see if you've got a bowel, inf a bowel inflammation problem solution in that gut, what you have to go through is stage one, two, and three clinical trial. And if yes, that thing that you've scraped out of the bioconcentrator of the ocean does reduce the inflammation of bowels and it's not toxic to animals or people, then it will be marketed as a little pink pill. And it's stringent. It's hard to go through. It's millions and millions of dollars to go through that process. So why don't we just allow that process to function with psychedelics? And essentially that was the decision that was made and that's what's happening. Well, that's great. Okay. So fine. I will let you go soon, but I just wanted to ask you one last thing. Um, how do you see Obviously, if, if, I, I sort of think if these centers are opened and eventually I think inevitably they will be, how do you see that changing uh, the community? How do you see that? Are we going to get back at some point to the way that the indigenous people are sort of connected to things or 
I mean, it could only help, I suppose, but I just wanted to see so your, what your sort of vision of the future would be like um, once, once these things are sort of up and running in a sense. Well, I start out simple, which is, yes, we'll be more effective at treating um, specific illnesses. That's stage one. Um, giving people a sense of spirituality. Um, often psychedelics are perceived as the most meaningful or the most um, spiritual experience of people's lives. So allowing people to have access to that, I think would help people lead more balanced, um, healthy lives and hopefully start to reconnect with the planet in some way. Our, our, our disconnection with the planet is causing us a significant amount of harm yeah. um, today, you know, as the hurricanes descend. Right. And so, uh, so we, we really need to rethink um, how, we're, how we treat our planet and, and start to connect with a larger sense. And, you know, I, th I think these are things that psychedelics could offer. Are there any Western countries that have sort of adopted this in any way? Or is it just, are we sort of blazing new ground here? Well, if I think about what's happened in the Netherlands, the Netherlands have had access historically to full-grown psychedelic cubensis mushrooms, and then that was shut down, and then it became truffles, which is an underground psychedelic mushroom. Right. And so for many decades, uh, the Netherlands have had access to psychedelics with very, very few problems. And they really haven't put in a, you can only access through licensed trained practitioners level of safety and still the relatively safe so there are people within the culture who have just stepped up to the plate and are offering the service uh, in a structured kind of way but they're it's kind of ad hoc you can also just go and buy them and do them yourself mm -hmm. so the netherlands is an interesting model it hasn't produced harm and the the, the lack of criminalization probably does good um, the discussions in the states are interesting because there are decriminalization and legalization initiatives with with um, cubensis mushrooms, right. and the decriminalize basically say the police will place it as the lowest possible priority, but it doesn't offer any way of regulating it. The Oregon initiative, Oregon 2020, is the one that I'm most interested in. It's Tom and Sherry Eckhart who are leading the charge on that one. Is what they're proposing is that psychedelics be legalized, mushrooms be legalized in a very specific context, which is basically trained practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I'm really rooting for that particular one because I think just decriminalization initiatives aren't particularly interesting. I'm much more interested in how we as a society, you know, weave these into our society in a way that maximizes the benefit, minimizes the harms. Right. And so that's really the question that I ask is how do we, how do we guide people in these experiences in a whole variety of different ways that helps people to live happier lives? Yeah. And, and couples counseling. I mean, em the empathogens are really helpful for couples. You know, it's, uh, yeah. we know that. We know yeah. that uh, bonding and increasing empathy is a good thing. And when couples kind of work with medicines to help their relationship, um, it can be really helpful in terms of strengthening their relationships. Yeah. Like you said, I think supervision is the, is the biggest thing. Um, yeah. Guide people through these experiences. It's been great talking to you and um, yeah, good luck at the conference and uh, really is a pleasure to talk to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, David. And that was my conversation with Mark Hayden. To find out more about Mark, head over to markhayden.com or visit maps.org or mapscanada.org to find out more about the clinical studies they are currently involved with. The Psychedelic Suitcase is produced by Carolyn Myers and myself, your host, Dave McNee. So join us again when we unpack more of the Psychedelic Suitcase. Until then, safe travels. <laughs>